Hello, this is Angela Slaughter again. The topic of this lecture is the Chapter 1 material, Marketing Value to Consumers, Firms, and Societies. Now, before we get too far along in the lecture, let me state this. I'm only going to state it one time, and that is if you only listen to the online lectures and you fail to read the book, you will not be able to glean enough information from these lectures in order to master the material. You will probably not do well on the quizzes, and you will probably not do well on the test. These mini lectures are designed to give you a very, very brief introduction to what the book is describing. In some of the later chapters, when things start to get a little more complex, we will concentrate on one, maybe two concepts from the chapter that I will um, be explaining in detail. Now, this is just additional information to help guide your reading. This is not a replacement for reading the chapter. slide moving over. There we go. So let's move on to the job of management and marketing. And when most people think of marketing, they think of selling and advertising. Specifically, when you may think of sales teams or attending trade shows, hosting product promotions, um, buying advertising on radio or television, or even launching a call center. But the job of management is much more than that. When we look at the example in the book, which um, was bicycles, let's think about how many types of styles and bikes are available in the market today. So another example would be cell phones. Um, if you think just about cell phones, many different cell phones come to mind. Um, there are high-tech phones, uh, smartphones, basic phones, folding phones, sliding phones, touch screens, and if you put your mind to it, you probably can add five or six phone types to that list. It's the job of marketing management to look at the customer value and analyze the customer needs. Now, after all, production can make however many types of um, phones and styles of phones it wants to, but if the phones do not meet the consumer's needs, then the company is going to go out of business. So the relationship between marketing and production should be very close. And these are all the different steps that marketing or all the different functions that um, marketing performs. Okay, so one of the more challenging functions of marketing is to predict the future wants of customers. Oh boy, that can really keep marketing busy. And if we think about our first cell phone, a much different cell phone comes to mind than the ones available on the market today. The first tel cell phone that my company had could only be operated from the car, had to be professionally mounted, and looked very much like the phone in our home. Um, my first portable phone was a tacky beige phone that weighed about three pounds, and the reception was terrible. Today, my cell phone is much more than a phone, but also a small computer. It is so small that I can lose it under the papers on my desk or in my briefcase. And marketing has had to anticipate the required changes to the phone and meet the demand. Now, with the advent of iPhones, smartphones, and tablets, the competition is even more heated than it ever was before. Now the marketing department at BlackBerry and Apple have to concentrate on physical design of a phone, plus be proactive in identifying the ways we want to use our phones tomorrow. Keep color scheme. Okay. Already, as many of you as, as many of you already know, the competition in techno in the technology department is uh, very heated, and a company that cannot predict the wants of its customers is likely to lose them. And. As if that weren't enough, the marketing department also has to estimate the demand for everything that they make. So when we look at cell phones, the marketing department must decide not only what should be produced, but how much of any style of phone should be produced, all while keeping a careful eye on the consumer to attempt to discover what they would want in the future. And if they want newer features, when should those phones be produced? When should they be sent to market? Once the phones are produced, where should they be sent? To which stores? For how much should the phones be sold for? And how should we promote 
the new model. And let's not forget about the competition. What are they doing? Can they compete with us? And if so, are they doing a better job of meeting the customer's needs, or are we doing a better job? If something goes wrong with the product, how are we going to make it right with the customer so that we do not lose future business? So this slide gives you a great overview of everything for which marketing is responsible. It, it certainly sounds like a huge job, doesn't it? But we can clearly see the relationship now between marketing and production. Marketing and production are key functions that create customer satisfaction. And marketing cannot work in a vacuum, and neither can production. Now, on a personal level, marketing is important to you personally. It is important to you because it impacts the price that you're going to pay for products. If a product is over-marketed, you could end up paying too much. If a, pro if a product is under-marketed, you might not even consider it because the company has not informed you of the product's features and benefits. And in addition, marketing is important to your job. And it doesn't matter if you are working in marketing or not. Even if you decide to go into some other area of business, you have to know how to market yourself. After all, if another job candidate knows how to market themselves to the employer, it is highly likely that you are going to have to give up that job to the candidate with the superior marketing skills. And marketing also affects innovation and standards of living. Marketing departments are watching you. They know more about what you buy than you do. Let's think about it. Let's think about all of those discount cards that you have in your wallet or on your keychain. Every time you use that card, the marketing department is collecting information on what you buy, how often you buy it, if you prefer certain name brands, at what price level you purchase products, and at which store locations you frequent. And although you can save a lot of money with discount cards, you should also be aware that the company is recording your buying habits every time you use them. That might not be so bad, though. Have you, have you noticed that the stores have started getting very effective in offering you coupons on products that you actually buy? For instance, at Food Lion, the system analyzes your needs and only generates coupons for you on the products you use. No more getting coupons for Pampers if you don't have a baby and ice cream for the brand you do not prefer. It's a trade-off, and I think it's a good one. Every time I go to the store, I save anywhere from 3 to $10, depending upon my purchase. Now, marketing is not only about the consumer. Of course, that is critical to the success of a business, but it is also about society as a whole. After all, in defining you and your preferences, marketing departments are able to make broad assumptions about society. It is as much a social process as anything else. Have you ever noticed that when one company changes their style, features, or benefits, other companies also change? And this applies to clothing styles, shoe styles, car designs, television shows, and anything else you can think of. The reason that it happens is that marketing on a macro level has matched production supply with consumer demand. And in order for a company to stay in business, it has to pay attention to these important trends. So the key characteristics um, apply to both profit and not-for-profit organizations. In fact, the not-for-profit not organizations are just beginning to assert themselves from a marketing standpoint. So think about it. Think about all the television ads that you have seen for the American Red Cross, the United Way, Salvation Army. You know, marketing is more than just per persuasion. And with the vast availability of information on products, it is difficult to say that marketing is in, business, in the business of persuasion persuading people in today's market. Now marketing departments are being persuaded by the consumer. And marketing begins with needs and does not operate in a vacuum. And the information exchanges are important between all other business departments and marketing. It's not just about the exchange of the it's not just about the product or service itself. Now this um, slide basically explains the economies of scale. If you've taken economics um, or some of the finance classes, you may have gone through this already. Let me briefly explain to you what economies of scale are. Um, basically what it means is that the more a company produces, the lower the per unit cost will be. 
So producers want to maximize their standardized output to reduce their unit cost. Now let's talk about the differences between the production sector and the consumption sector. Now obviously the production sector includes those companies that manufacture products and offer services. And the consumption sector includes businesses and individuals who are in the market to purchase those products and services. But these two groups do not think the same thing, nor do they have the same priorities. For instance, when we think in terms of quantity, producers want to manufacture the maximum number of products in hopes that the consumer will buy all of them. So we're talking about production volume here. Producers want to maximize that. That's also how they achieve those economies of scale. Of course, when you and I buy products, we usually buy in small quantities. So this discrepancy in quantity is an issue that marks a lost result. Producers also want to standardize their project products as much as they can because of the cost of producing a variety. So they want to produce as little as they can in terms of variety. Consumers want choices and colors, sizes, styles, and shapes. So marking must be meant to production to make these options available to you based upon the feedback you receive from them. Now, let's look at the practical side of what marking does. There is a natural separation between producers and consumers. Producers do not set up residence in your neighborhood. You do not pass through any of the producers of the product you use every day on the way to school or work. And this is called spatial separation. Marketing decides in which stores to place your products so that they will reach you. The producers also want to produce products around the clock. So please don't purchase products around the clock. To work, you might not even purchase the product in the same year that it was created. Let me share something with you that I learned recently about separation in time. I had a can of tomatoes in my pantry and I noticed that it had expired earlier in the month and I was concerned because it was not seafood so I called the manufacturer. I asked if the product was still fit for sale. Now the customer service representative, surely as part of the marketing department, told me that all the device not recommend was changing the product due to packaging issues after the best time. The product was still probably safe and edible. In fact, she told me that the product was almost three years old. I was later that I had bought it about six months ago. She told me that that can of tuna had been stored in a warehouse for two years before it ever went to the store. So it's only a couple of years of shelf life remains of product at the time it becomes available to me for the store. Of course, I was surprised. If I wasn't comfortable with a safe past the date on the can, how could I become comfortable knowing that the product was actually two years old? Amazing. But this is a fair example of how market bridges the gap between when a producer wants to make a product and when a consumer actually wants to buy it. So the can of tuna I bought this week was probably part of a production run from 2010. So the customer service agent also bridged the gap in information. Obviously, the producer has more information regarding my tuna than I do, so marketing helps to make sure that I get that information. In terms of value, producers are cost conscious and want to minimize the cost of expenditures on production. They like to expend on cost of goods sold, and they get to keep in terms of their profit. I, as a consumer, want to spend as little as possible. I also buy based upon how well the product performs. The same could be true to meet my wants and needs. How much am I willing to spend on that can of tuna? The marketing person wants to give me some promotion. They want me to be the one to want what I want to sell. Of course, the production separation is that as well. I want the money that has the product. I want the product that has to back up the money to the producer. The tuna that I own at the tuna shop covers all the trips that you can think of that you had to walk to get the tuna shop into business. Marketing explains to the owners of the product to you at the point of sale. Everyone supply chain person marketing person would be used by those organizations that actually collaborate on going and meeting them. So all these companies are collecting information that producers and consumers will use for product price pricing and pricing now and in the future. Let's put it this way. All the customer 